uh, Wednesday, uh, uh, March 14, 2012, lesson 6, Tanya with Rabbi Turn on some ground today. So we're talking now, we're understanding the difference between the way we understood a righteous person against a not righteous person until now, which was 50-50. If someone had 65 good deeds and only 35 negative deeds, they were a good guy. As opposed to if they had 49 good deeds and 51 negative deeds, they weren't on the right side of things. And now we're saying that if someone has even one sin, they're not a righteous person, because righteousness is entire. It's an entire connection to God. So therefore, the sin, they're lacking in one area. They're lacking one default. One part of the connection. They have a flaw. So right now, we're in the middle of defining that. And we say that, Even someone who sees their friends sinning, and they don't stop them. They have the ability to stop somebody from sinning, and they don't. Nikarasha. They're called wicked. What that means is that, not that they're wicked, but it means that they're not entirely pure. They're not entirely holy. The kol she came to Kabbalah from the battle Ezumitz as I say, for sure if they don't do something that's positive, she actually the kaima that they could do. Kol kol she actually lazy but terror like someone who could study Torah. The ena isik and they don't study. She love darsha rezal that the rabbis say kidvara by a baza. The gamer he curries he curries. Upon this, God said it's disgusting. It should be cut off. Remember, sure, someone who doesn't utilize their time is considered a rasha, is considered evil, worse than if they violated one of the rabbi's enactments. And here's his question. For sure, this middle guy, never missed a moment of Torah study. And for this, this is how Rabbah made a mistake. We asked earlier that there was this guy named Rabbah. He was one of the most righteous people ever. And he said, as he was dying, I think I'm a Bainani. He said, how could Rabbah be a Bainani? How could Rabbah be a middle guy? How could Rabbah say that he was sort of like a 50-50 type of guy when the angel of death couldn't take his soul? But now we're understanding a Bainani is someone who doesn't sin for a moment. The difference between a Bainani and a Tzaddik a Benini being the middle person, a Tzaddik being the righteous person, is that a Benini has inclinations for sin and doesn't sin, and a righteous person doesn't even begin to have inclinations for sin. But neither of those people sin. So the second one starts sinning, like myself, they become in the category of not even a Benini, not even this middle person. They become in the category that they have evil within them. Again, it doesn't mean that they are an evil person. It means there's evil within them. That means that if one completely refined all the evil or had complete control over the evil, so evil would never come out of they would never miss a step. They would always be righteous. The only question is, are they righteous only on their actions but their thoughts are still working on? Or is even their thoughts refined? And then within righteous people there's different levels. But I don't fall within any of those categories because for me there's times I miss that. Many times. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It means that I have flaws within me that I'm working on. But that's how we define Rabba. Rabba is someone who said maybe he's a Bainani. Maybe he's someone who, while he always had a perfect action, maybe he still had evil within him that he was never letting out. So now we're going to pause. There's a note, Haga, in the Hebrew is notes, different um, font, different um, size writing. And he's going to bring up that there's a part of Zayhar, there's a part of the, this book of Kabbalah that seems to say something that um, contrasts it, that that uh, that um, that negates this whole proof. Here, the Alter Rebbe brought up this whole proof. He said, you see a Talmud, he says this, and you see about Rabbah, and you brought up different levels of Tzadikim and Rishayim, different righteous and evil people, so we see that there's a different framework. And you can ask a question, it says in Mashakasab Azar Chayyav Gimel, Dach Reish Lamed Aleph, Kol Shemaitan Aben Esav, Anyone who lessens their sins, who? And what it goes on to say is that anyone who lessens their sins is righteous. So obviously it's not someone who's perfect and beyond perfect. It's someone who lessens their sins. So he says, he shiles of Nuna Lo Yo, this was Rav Nuna. This is what the Zohar was saying, is that this was one question from Rav Nuna to Eliyahu, to Elijah the prophet. And the answer given was that that's only 
the outer framework of things and the inner workings, the way it works is that a righteous person is righteous. It says, as it says over there and as it fits in here. Delayal. Then he ends off with an interesting comment. He says, There's um, a concept in Torah. Sometimes we bring down a point. Um, we'll bring down a verse. And you'll hear one person say one commentary, another person will say another commentary, and a third person will say a third commentary. And you simply say, but what's the right commentary? Which one's the right opinion? And it's brought down that there's 70 faces to Torah. And every, in other words, everything has 70 explanations that are true about it. It doesn't negate one or negate the other. They can both be true. This is what we say um, with any deed. You know, why do we light the menorah from right to left? Which I don't know if that's the best example. But, um... There could be 70 explanations upon that. If you want to explain why God started the Torah with a base and not an Aleph, why did God start the Torah with the second letter of the Torah, the, the alphabet and not the first letter, there's 70 explanations to that. So it doesn't say that one is righter than the next. There's 70 right answers to that. And I heard a story once that someone came by the Lubavitch Rebbe of Nachman Mendel Schneerson, and they gave an explanation on something. I don't know if this is a true story, but they gave an explanation on something. And the, and the Rebbe turned to him and said, you know, there's 70 faces to Torah. There's 70 proper approaches to Torah. There's also 70 behinds to Torah. In other words, there's 70 bad explanations to Torah. And that's one of the 70 bad explanations. It's called Shivim Panim and Shivim Achirim. There's 70 heads to Torah and 70 tails to Torah. And that's one of the tail explanations. So just because there's 70 faces doesn't mean that every explanation is the right explanation. Doesn't mean that just because someone walked in and said, I've got an explanation, that's the right explanation. But there are many times where there could be two opposite explanations that are both correct and true and have truth to them. So that's what, that's what he's pointing out there. So he's saying, yes, there. In other words, saying that there is one way of defining a righteous person as a person who has more good than evil is a correct way of explaining a righteous person. Saying that a righteous person is someone who has no evil within them and no ability to contemplate evil is also a perfect explanation. They're both true explanations of righteous. Saying that a righteous person is a person who feels good when they wake up is not a proper explanation. It doesn't define anything. So there's 70 faces of the Torah, and these are two ways of looking at righteous people, middle people, and then people that we call evil, but evil is not the right term. People that have evil within them that they're working on. So we're going to go a little further, and we're going to define and explain what we're talking about. Because he's about to lay down the framework and then move into actual what he wants to get into. So the Hadamim Bialma, this that people in the world say, the Mechsa al Mechsa, which is half and half Mikri Bainini, is called a middle person. The Rav Zchui is Mikri Tzadik, and the majority of good is called righteous. Who Shema Meishel? It's like a borrowed term, Le'inyan Scharbeinish, for reward and punishment. In other words, they found this term, it seemed to fit, and they used it. Because the way it works is that we are judged after the majority of our actions. Then we're called righteous. Because we won the judgment. If we have more good than evil, then we're considered good. But the true name, the truth of the name, the If you want to go into the truth of divisions of righteous and middle, the rabbis clearly say, a righteous person is someone who their good rules them. never believe And there's a verse, it's from David, King David. And he says that my heart was empty within me. Shein Yitzhara, that King David, David did not have an evil inclination within him. He hargu betinus because he killed it in a fast. He fasted many times and he eventually killed his evil inclination. So what they're defining here is that a righteous person is someone who doesn't have evil inclination within them. One of the examples given, they say that a righteous person lacks one service. What is that service? There's a command that when one walks by um, and sees not kosher food, let's say they see um, a cheeseburger, the command is not to say, Ew, I don't want a cheeseburger, or oh, I don't eat shellfish. They're supposed to say, oh, that looks like it's really good. But God told me, and I'm not going to have it. 
Now, for some people, like if you take a kid who's raised in an Orthodox home and you offer them a cheeseburger, they make this taste like, you're going to put cheese on your burger? That's so weird. You're going to put like pepperoni on your pizza? You cute. You don't put meat on your pizza. And in essence, they're not fulfilling that command. In other words, in their minds, that's a disgusting food. They're not eating it because it's disgusting. If it would be good, maybe they would eat it. So, that is not the way of fulfilling the command, because we boil down the command is to do God's will. So, in essence, they should say, hey, that's probably a pretty good food. I mean, only like 80% of the world put meat on their pizza, and only a few people don't. So, it's probably a good thing. I just don't eat it because God said I shouldn't eat it. And where that, where that would come to play for such a kid would be if you give them a chocolate bar. You say, hey, it's not a kosher chocolate bar. Oh, well, that's probably a very good chocolate bar because I know all chocolate's good, but I can't have it. So then that's where they hit the level. But a truly righteous person, someone who truly doesn't have anything within them that's not animalistic in a bad way, but animalistic in a humane way, they would see a not kosher item as if it didn't exist. That's not food, that's dirt. It's not kosher. It's obviously just like dirt on the ground. There's no, why would I want to eat that? And they can't fulfill the command of saying, I'm not eating that because God told me so. Because they just don't see it as food. But that's how perfect and pure a righteous person is. In other words, according to the framework, who is righteous, it means that within themselves they're righteous. They're completely righteous through and through. So that puts it on a different framework. That means that they're not on the same playing field as myself or anyone else that goes through the struggles of gossip, the struggles of how to utilize their time, the struggles of day-to-day typical things that we go through, anger, our emotions. They have a different playing field. And based on that, they have a different challenge in life. Their goal in life is not the same goal that we have in life. In other words, for myself, my goal in life is working on my emotions, working on my character traits, working on utilizing my time, working on self-refinement. That's not their challenge. Their challenge s- starts where our challenge, so to speak, ends because they're not working on self refinement They may have been born self-refined. It doesn't mean that they have um, an easier time than us. They have a different set of goals and aspirations. But it also means that we shouldn't benchmark ourselves against them. Oh, well, look at that righteous person and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be just like them. We should aspire to be like them, but we shouldn't say that we have to be, you know, be on the same playing field as them because they're living a different, they have a different makeup than us. And that's also the difference between a bainani, the middle person, the righteous person, and the evil person. The, the righteous person doesn't even have the challenge, they don't have the ability to challenge. It says the Alter Rebbe, when he was 19 years old, he met the, he met the, um, the Magid, and he went in for a meeting, it was the second time he was in Mizrich, he went once, he wasn't so interested, he came back to get a kerchief, and he went in, and he met him, and he said, my challenge is that I've never felt challenged before. That was his big challenge. That's something that people, that immediately defines where you're playing. In other words, people that have challenge, that's what's typical, that's what life is about. Life is about overcoming challenges. The greater we accomplish the challenges, the greater the challenges get, the more we grow, the more we grow, we live, this is, this is healthy living. And he couldn't begin to find a challenge because within him there was no challenge. Within him it was service of God. It says about the... the I want to say that Tzemach Tzedek, another one of the Chabad Rebbeim, he taught his body the code of Jewish law. In other words, his body automatically followed the code of Jewish law. He didn't have to think about it. In the middle of the night you'd be sleeping and you're not supposed to t- touch parts of your body he would, his body wouldn't do it. He didn't have to know what day of the week it was. His body automatically on Shabbos wouldn't break the laws. His body just didn't do it. There was a meeting, there was a debate about something, and he said, this is the proper answer. And one of the rabbis challenged him and said, how do you know that's the proper answer? He said, because my body is telling me that. My body is so trained to pick up the proper answer, that's obviously the right answer. But that's a different playing field, because within him there is no challenge. So it's... It's as simple as us to take a step. It's as simple as him to take the right step. Therefore, he has a different set of challenges. And that, that's what they're trying, the Altar is trying to define. So we have to separate this. We have to say that it's not half and half more good than evil and then more evil than good. Because then, in all of our minds, how come we're not like as righteous as Moses? We could be Moses. Moses has more good than evil. We have more good than evil. So now we've got to work harder. What he's saying is that's not the beginning of the matchups. The beginning of the matchup is that a righteous person has no beginning of possibility of evil within them. They cannot sin. A 
Benini, a middle person, is someone who could technically sin, but never has. So, the average person we meet today, first of all, is nowhere near a righteous person, because they could sin. But second, if they have sinned, that already proves that they're not even the middle, they're not even this middle framework of, of complete self-control they never have. So we have to look at where we are in order to be able to digress ourselves. And again, it doesn't make us evil. It doesn't mean um, a lot of kids going through the Chabad system, they learn Tanya, they learn this first chapter, they immediately learn they're not, they're not the righteous person, they're not even the middle person, and they're lucky if they're the good wicked person as opposed to the wicked wicked person. And they start having these panic attacks. I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to go to this, I'm never, I'm not, I'm anyways off the map. But that's completely not the purpose. For the, ma- for the marking purpose, it is 50-50. So if you did more good than evil, you are a righteous person. But we're here looking up as the makeup. On the makeup of things, we have to know who we are. We shouldn't lie to ourselves. There's people that lie to themselves, they say, I'm in control. If you want to talk about addiction, I'm not an addict, I can control this. The fact that they're lying to themselves is what's making them slip up. If we're honest with ourselves and say we do have negative inclinations within us, we do even slip up once in a while, then we can start saying, okay, what can we do to help ourselves? As opposed to we say, no, I'm perfect. I don't, I cannot sin. When you tell me, like, gossip about other people, I don't even hear it. It's like, who are we fooling? We're just fooling ourselves or just hurting ourselves. And even if you want to say the middle person, the middle person is who we aspire to be, that we could control ourselves. But to lie and say we're there, what will we accomplish? We've just entered a state of denial. We don't even notice I'm lying. We have to identify who we are. We're, we're people that have strong negative inclinations. It doesn't make us bad. We were born this way. God gave us this challenge. And we can work on it, overcoming them. And once we get that, we can use these tools to move further. And he's going to go. So he first defines this tzaddik as someone who, like King David, King David, he killed his evil through fasting. But King David was someone who, like, to say that I am like King David is completely, like, not thought out. He continues, You haven't reached this level. You're more good than evil. You're not in this category of tzaddik. It doesn't make you a bad person. But you should know you're not this tzaddik. Therefore, now it makes sense. There's a, fan, there's a teaching of the teach of the rabbis that Ra'al Kadesh Baruch Hu, God saw the tzaddikim of these righteous people shame what and that they're very few Ahmad Vishosam Bakhuldur Vadur Hu Bahu He took and he placed them amongst the generations. <coughs> so what we're saying is that now that we've come to this honest opinion of what a righteous person is, now we know well God took these people and he dispersed them amongst the generations. Moses was righteous. Joshua was righteous. Um Jacob was righteous, you know? Aaron was righteous. It doesn't mean that every person is righteous. Not every person is supposed to be righteous. We're not all the same being. It says that um, Adam and Eve, so they're really one soul, and they're the inclusive soul of all of our souls. In other words, they were, if you want to take it, they had in, in an hour or so, they had the challenge of not eating from the tree, which is like at that time was an all-inclusive challenge that we experienced over the generations. It was all in one moment. And they couldn't overcome it. It was too much at once. And they ate from the tree, however, you know, however the story goes in, in, the, in the Torah. And it says that that soul was taken and dispersed amongst the generations. That everybody is a part of that soul and we all work on a little part that we're fixing, we're correcting. But by definition, that means that some people are from the arm, so to speak. Some people are from the head, so to speak. Some people are from the heart, so to speak. We all have our part in this job. It says that our generation primarily is from the heels. That we're working on the heels, just the endings of this soul. But when you take someone who's a righteous person, generally those souls come from the mind. They come from the mind of Adam. That's where it comes from. Some of the souls are entirely new, but... That's the general framework. So we're all different. We all have different missions. So God took these souls, these leader souls, and he didn't just dump them all in one generation. Like, hey, you guys are all leaders. You'll get along in this generation. He took them. He spread them out. Mordechai was a leader. I can't identify all of them, but there, there's different people that were leaders. The Baal Shem Tov was a leader. There's a story. Hmm? There's a story about the Baal Shem Tov, but uh, yeah. that's the one they started wanting to have a song. You right. have to wait a certain time 
So it would be the perfect time for him to come down. Right. And these souls are very carefully dispersed. They're dispersed for very... I mean, every soul is carefully dispersed. Our souls are also carefully dispersed. But these were not put in groups or anything. They're spread out for this purpose because they're different. They have a different mission. And we also have a mission. So that's... Now that we have this framework, that, that saying makes sense. Because if you think about it, we'll get to two dots here because because of the tzaddik is the foundation of the world mm-hmm. think about it if it is the framework we, we were used to match it up from with more good than evil and more evil than good then how could God disperse them amongst the, the, the nations it, it, it's across the generations it's our choice we could do more good than evil and we're a righteous person so what we're defining now makes that phrase make sense that it's not necessarily our choice we're not born perfect only very few people are born perfect, and then they have their mission to do. So therefore, yeah, he spread the most generations. Our free choice it isn't whether we're... In other words, the question asked, don't you have a free choice to be a righteous person? Is that one of your free choices? And the answer is, you have a free choice to accomplish your mission in life. You don't have a free choice to be born perfect. You don't have a free choice to be born without challenges. You don't have a free choice which family you're born to. These aren't your free choices. You can't say, my free choice was that I was born to a family that, you know, was divorced or was anything else like that because I wanted this challenge. No, this is the place you set into. Once you're there, you have a free choice to accomplish your goal and mission, your aspirations, and refine yourself. A righteous person's free choice is a completely different free choice than what we have. Now that we've defined that, he's going to go through and explain our makeup. And now that we've laid down the framework, we spent two or three weeks laying down this framework of, of, so to speak, breaking our thought process until now. Most people spend their entire lives thinking a certain way. And then it, it takes a long time to unwind that. Again, it doesn't mean we're negative people. It's the biggest misconception of, of people with a Tanya that, oh, I'm a, I'm a Russia. In our minds, Russia's like, you know, you're wicked. You're evil. You're going to the worst place possible. It's, you have some negative tendencies within you. It doesn't make you evil. It makes you great. You're working on them. You recognize them. If you know the problem, that's half the solution. So now he's going to explain this according to one of the um, famous um, Kabbalists, Reb Chaim Vital. So, Achbir Inyan al Kosov, Reb Chaim Vital Zal, Bishar HaKadosh and there's, he wrote um, a book and has like gates, so to speak, like gateways that enter different, it's like chapter headings. And this one is the gate to holiness. To Chol Ish Yisrael Echad Tzadik Bechad Rasha Yishtei Neshamais. He writes that every Israelite has two souls. The Chsiv Neshamas and Yasisi. Because it says God created these souls. Chain Shtei Nefashais Nefesh Achas Mitzad Klipa. One is from the side of Klipa, the Sitra Achra, which I'm going to explain. There's, um, in Kabbalah, there's two explanations. There's Kedusha, which is holiness and positivity. And the other side, the negative side, is called Klipa. What does Klipa actually mean? It means a shell. So people take it, they, mis- they mistranslate it. They say, Klipa is, is evil. You have Kedusha is holiness, and Klipa is evil. You have Kedusha is like Gan Eden, Olam Haba, heaven. And Klipa is like Gehenna or hell. It's not that. Klipa is a shell. Just like um, to eat an orange, you have a shell protecting it, which means you don't eat the shell. The shell is not tasting good. It doesn't necessarily serve your purpose in eating the fruit. It actually is a hindrance to you. You have to peel off the shell to get to the fruit. So too, the shell of life, of physicality, and of challenges is something that's, per se, not something you want to eat. It's something that's protecting your inner fruit, protecting your inner joy, happiness, and serenity. But it's also necessary. It's a great protection. If an orange wouldn't have a shell, then it would be it wouldn't be an orange. It wouldn't be able to survive to get to me. It wouldn't be able to, you know, there would be birds that eat it or worms that eat it. It's a protection to the fruit. And so too, this shell protects godliness. If you want to say the world is a shell concealing godliness, by peeling off that shell in the right way at the right time, you're revealing godliness. But if it wouldn't have that shell, there would be no godliness, so to speak, to reveal. You need the shell for both purposes. So the physicality is a shell to spirituality, but it's a necessary shell. We don't eat the shell. 
We don't say, oh, I'm so glad I bought a lemon. I can peel off the shell and eat it. But there's a truth in saying, I'm so glad a lemon has a shell. I'm so glad, you know, it's like saying, I'm so glad fruit had pits, because otherwise there'd be no more fruit. So, too, we say that I'm so glad there is this shell of physicality which allows me to access spirituality. Because without it, I wouldn't be able to access this spirituality. If I wouldn't have the tools of the physical world, I wouldn't be able to access spirituality or godliness. Some people say, um, I was asked, am I happy that I have an addiction? And the answer is always this, like, catch-22, or uh, from what I've heard, are you happy you have an addiction? No, but maybe I'm happy where it took me to. I'm happy of the program that it put me into. And the idea is that the addiction allowed certain people to find a spirituality, a godly relationship that they didn't have before the program. And they would have never had if not for the pro, if not being forced into this program. Since they were forced into it, they were given it and gave, enriched their lives in many ways. Without this physical world, without the physical challenges, we would not be able to attain the spiritual connection, relationship, and revelation of godliness that we're able to attain. So therefore, every person has two things within them. They have the physical, and they have the spiritual. They have the animalistic soul, and the godly soul. And he's defining now the makeup of the animalistic soul, which comes from the klipa, it comes from the shell. Its purpose is, as a shell, is to protect us. It doesn't necessarily taste good, and it, it's not the main purpose. Its main purpose is what's it protecting, but that's what it is. And where is it? It's in, found in the blood of a person. It gives life to the body. And he brings a source for that. The, the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And what comes from here? This is where all of our negative tendencies come from, from this soul. All of our negative tendencies come from there. The anger and ego, from the fire that goes up above. Um, Maimonides brings that there's four elements in the world. Actually, it's, I think he it brings five. But uh, there's four elements that make up the world. In other words, if you go down to the basic, basic fundamentals, everything is either fire, water, air, or dirt. These are the four things that make up everything according to Maimonides. There's a debate if a star, if um, like there's a plasma or a star, that is like another category. But short of that, everything is... Um, Four, or one of these four. So they say that, for example, you can take anything and break it back down to its base elements. If you take wood, within wood is elements of fire, elements of dirt, elements of air, and elements of water. By burning it, you're taking out the fire, you're evaporating the water, and you're using air to burn it, and what you're left with is just dirt. Um, and you can do this with anything. Obviously, water is just water, and wind is just air, but technically air also has a little bit of dirt in it and so on and so forth. There's different books that explain how this works. But these are the four building blocks brought down in Maimonides. And what he's doing now is he's saying those four building blocks found, that means every person's also made up of these four things. We all have within us these four character traits. And he's defining what those four character traits are within us. So the animal soul is these four character traits. What are they? So if you have fire, fire is anger and ego. It doesn't mean that fire is bad. A burning fire is good too. If you have no fire, you have no energy. But what could come out of that is a lot of anger and a lot of ego. Right. And this also makes the definition of the animal soul. The animal soul is not a negative soul. It's not like we have a positive and a negative within us. We have an animal soul. The animal soul can be used for the greatest positive. In other words, if we're a very fiery person, that could be phenomenal. You can give a fiery speech and inspire hundreds of people. You could be fire it up about a great thing and you're going to cause a great movement or coalition or, or changeover. But you could also be fired up and use your anger to scream at somebody and totally demolish them. So, he's defining the four aspects of the animal soul. You should know the four makeups. One of them is the fire, which is, which is this anger and this gaiva, this ego. If you don't have the anger and you don't have the ego, the fire is the most positive thing possible. Or one of the most positive things possible. What's the next one he goes through? Then you have the next one is water, which water leads to pleasure and desire. Desire and pleasure. Because mayim, it's not from kolmini tainug, there's a verse 
that says the water wets all forms of pleasure. So again, you have another aspect within us, which is water. We have fire, which is this, this energy which could come out in anger and ego. The next one is we're made up of water. There's a part of us that's water, which is our, our desires and our pleasures. If we let the desires and pleasures run us, then that's also very animalistic. Animals are very self-serving in that aspect. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with having a strong desire for something. I have a strong desire for the redemption. I have a strong desire for Mashiach to come. But if I, my strong desire is for something that's very basing and self-serving, and for a very small pleasure, a very base pleasure, then yeah, that is a negative aspect. And again, these all come from the animal soul. The Hoylis, the Leitzanus, the Svaris, the Zvarim Betelem, the Ruach. Next is the wind, which the wind is like, um, it's like a fleeting breeze. So it's the, the, the matchup is going to be with um, light things, waste of time, small talk, which are frivolity, all these sillinesses. Which again, there's nothing wrong with silliness in the right time. There's nothing wrong with being light in the right time. It's when one's wasting themselves in those areas. In the right time, it's great as positive. And the next one is viatsus, viatsus, depression and laziness, we said, offer comes from dirt. So what he's done is he's defined the four makeups of the animal soul, how they can come out in a negative framework, how they could be negative, why we define it as, oh, you have a good soul and an evil soul, because these are the ne negative frameworks we see. We should understand that it's not limited to it. It is a shell. These are positive things, too. They could be used for positive things. There's a time for depression, too. It's just a very, very small, short time. It has to be done the right way in the right time. And the next thing he says is this punchline. Our positive qualities also come from there. For example, being merciful and having kindness come from there. They come from these different makeups. This is anything about godliness, that godliness is removing us from the world. In other words, it's elevating us from the world. It says that one of the things the Altar Rebbe would daven for, would pray for, when he prayed, was to be able to be spiritual without losing his connection to physical. In other words, when you became so godly and so spiritual, things didn't matter. When someone comes in crying to you and says, I'm going through this life crisis, you know, I don't know, my kid was driving a car and it spun out of control and now they're in the hospital, and you say, yeah, I'm feeling godly right now, it's God's will. You haven't helped them in the slightest. You've removed yourself so much from the world that you're not helping them. So what he would pray for is that he'd be able to be connected to this world in the greatest spiritual way. That, I'm so sorry to hear that. God is with you. While well, he knew, feeling inside, this is God's will. And that is where you have this connection of, that's what the animalistic soul is for, to keep us tied down, but not in a negative way, in a positive way. <clears throat> when someone comes in and they say, you know, I don't have enough money for this, and you say, well, you know, God is here, God is with you. There's two ways of saying that. Well, God doesn't want you to do that, obviously. If he wanted you to do that, there'd be money for it. Or, I'm sure God will provide and God's going to help. It's, it's two different answers. And that's where it comes from, from this animal soul. That's why the altar we prayed that he shouldn't become so removed to lose the connection. It says in the Torah that um, Aaron had two sons who went into the temple in the Holy of Holies to do a service that they weren't asked to do. Um, their names were um, Eliezer and Asamar, right? Oh, was any summer, I think. They went into the, um, they went to Holy of Holies to do their own service. And it says that a fire of God came, and it came and burned them on the inside, and they passed away in the Holy of Holies. So it explains that what happened was they went on a limb, on a limb. they went too far in their spiritual service, they didn't have a return service. In other words, they became so spiritually infused that their souls left them, and they never came back to do the physical labor. It's like those who spend their whole lives spiritually refining themselves and never go out and do the physical work that's connected with it. And that's what he's saying. The good things come from these animalistic traits too. They are our physical labor. This is what we have to do. If we didn't have animalistic traits, we wouldn't have We wouldn't have kindness to someone. It says that Moses asked to see the reason for pain and suffering in the world. On the commentary say this. And 
One of the answers, it says God did not tell him. But one of the answers I once saw, one, one of the answers I once read, was if we understood the reason why there was pain and suffering, we wouldn't have compassion anymore. In other words, we understand. When someone goes to the dentist and they're, they're hurting during the cleaning, oh, my teeth are hurting. You don't say, oh, I feel so bad for you. You say, of course they're hurting, but that is cleaning your teeth. That's what they're doing. You go to the chiropractor. The chiropractor is like about to crack your back in eight different ways. It's not like, oh, I feel so bad, this is going to hurt. It's like, this is going to make you feel better. Wham! And all of a sudden, okay, you'll feel better soon. You know? But we understand the process. When a doctor gives someone a needle, it's, you know, it's going to hurt, but this is what it's going to do for you. If we understood why there had to be pain and suffering in the world, a lot of the compassion would be lost. We understand. Of course this has to happen. Sorry, it's got to happen to you, but it's got to happen. And that is not the purpose. The purpose is for us to have compassion. I'm not explaining why there's pain and suffering, because I don't know. But there is a purpose for us having compassion, and that purpose comes not from the godly part. Because the godly part is connected to God. It comes from the physical part. The thing is that we have to, we have to work on the physical part that should be positive outcomes. It should be this idea of kindness instead of envy. It should be this idea of giving instead of taking. Um, maybe this is a good place to stop and do questions. Stop here? Yeah.